last meeting we have for the semester, and this has been a department that we've been hosting for the first time this fall. And so it's a great way to, to conclude our semester meetings. And as I mentioned in our email, we have uh, students for our undergraduate le graduate level. Some of them, many of them actually have their own businesses. So we've uh, shared with them uh, all your materials, the choral course you created, the wonderful talk you made on the 21CM, uh, your website, uh, and so I think it's gonna be a great opportunity to get to know more about you and for them to have opportunity to ask some questions. So thank you very much for joining us. And uh, why don't we just start with maybe you sharing a little bit about your story and then, you know, what, how you got to where you are in a summarized ver version and then we can open the, the session for discussion and, and questions from the students. Sure, yeah. So I, I was thinking since if you've, if you've seen my, um, my speech, then you probably know the, the basic rundown of you know, where I went to school and what I've been doing. So I thought for an introduction, I might just kind of tell, tell you about my daily life, you know, the kind of things I do on a typical day um, as a musician uh, running various businesses and, and the skills that I use on a daily basis that I didn't learn in music school. Um, so just like a little quick five minutes about that and then we can get into your questions. Um, so uh, so on a, a typical day, I'm, I'm still a flute player, so I practice usually a couple hours a day. And I do work as a freelance flute player. Um, and I organize for my ensemble, Helix Collective. And I, I run a, a film festival, so during certain seasons of the year, it's kind of concentrated in about seven, eight months. I do work on that. Um, and some teaching and some contracting of other musicians. Um, so as a, as a freelance flute player, I usually spend a couple hours a day practicing, just kind of keeping up my playing. Um, and then I'll do recording sessions, I'll play in pits for shows, I'll play typical orchestra concerts, I play sometimes with rock bands. Um, and the kind of things, skill, business skills I need for that that I didn't learn in music school are just keeping track of the financials of everything um, and making sure that you're getting paid. You notice if someone, you know, you played for someone a month ago and they haven't, <laughs> they haven't paid you yet. Keeping track of the expenses for that, um, for your taxes, and then keeping that, that work going. Um, is just a lot of networking, making sure that contractors know you, making sure other musicians are recommending you, um, and then just knowing how to work with other contractors, you know, how quickly they expect you to respond, which is a lot of times, you know, within the hour if you can, um, and definitely within the day, and um, things move really quickly, I think in a big city, how fast they expect you to respond. Um, and then I'm part of a team that works on my ensemble. We're a nonprofit, so we have a board. So we have, um, you know, work to do with keeping track of having meetings and getting advice from them. And then we split up our work among our ensemble members. So I do work booking concerts, emailing people, keeping up with people that we played for before, um, fundraising if we've got a project like a CD that we're fundraising for, so doing appeals for that, marketing concerts. Um, general marketing, just kind of keeping um, keeping people aware of us, and then the same um, financials, keeping track of a budget. You know, um, that that was one thing that's really helpful to me. Even though we have someone that does the finances for us, um, I do have to keep track of budgets that I, I hand over to her. So you know, um, having receipts for everything we spend money on, and um, you know, keeping track of um, getting tax forms for people we pay. So um, work like that, even if it's a relatively small ensemble, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of that um, kind of financial budgeting stuff to keep track of. Um, and then with the festival, um, we set up partnerships with um, with film schools. Uh, I send out um, emails to solicit sponsorships through companies um, that might sponsor us. We have an application process, so I have to organize you know, a place where people can go apply on Film Freeway to be part of the festival and then getting those applications to judges, so that whole process. Um, and then uh, booking halls, getting event insurance, um, we, which we started to do in the past couple of years, um, and you know, keeping track of the finances on that, um, you know, we you have to put out money ahead of time to you know secure a hall, 
Um, and then uh, little things like designing a step and repeat that goes behind the red carpet and designing a program because um, we're selling uh, that to businesses to be part of that. So making sure that looks really good. Um, and then I also work as a contractor, sort of through the Oaks Collective and also independently. So I need a working list of uh, you know a number of instrumentalists on every instrument. I think our list has a um, hundred violinists now, um, <laughs> because when we're filling out an orchestra, you need just a lot of options. Um, so having you know a running list of people that we can contact, um, and having a, you know a, a clear communication with everyone um, so that they know where to be. You know, it's really, there's kind of an art to an email, not too many emails, <laughs> but enough that everybody gets all the information for parking and where they need to be and all that kind of thing. Um, and then it's uh, the, the budgeting, again, having, being able to work an Excel sheet, send um, the budget to, to your client, and then client services. When you're contracting an orchestra for someone who doesn't necessarily know how orchestras run. Um, you know, they don't know about the 15 minute break you need, and they don't know about, um, you know, a lot of things that come up when you know you've been in orchestras, you know how they run, but you have to communicate that with people who are hiring you um, to, to hire a group of musicians. Um, and then I don't do a lot of teaching um, these days, but I've taught through nonprofit music schools, for profit music schools, and private lessons. And um, especially working privately, you have all the same um, kind of budget and financial issues as you do as a freelancer. It's just keeping, keeping track of those budgets and um, making sure that you're really keeping track of your expenses. Um, and throughout the year, how much you're making and how much you're spending, so you can estimate, um, you know, how much you're going to owe in taxes. And um, we now pay taxes quarterly uh, to help us not have a big surprise at the end of the year. Um, so, yeah. So that's just a little rundown of kind of what I might be doing on any given week, and um, you know, all all the things I need to know about that I just had no clue about um, in school. Nobody, nobody told me. <laughs> Well, I think this, I have a student who submitted a question ahead of time in writing, so I want to go ahead and start with that. Okay. Um, okay. There was something on my head. I was like, why is something on my head? Okay. Um, so this is from Joanna Stull. Are you here, Joanna? She's here. Can you see her? So yeah. Joanna asks, was your education helpful in diversifying your career? Or did you explore new avenues once school was complete? I, I think schools are doing a better job. There was um, there wasn't an entrepreneurship class like like this when I was in school. There was I, I did four degrees. Um, one of them I went back to school uh, for my doctorate. Um, but I think there was one course in those degrees that gave me anything besides music theory, history, or how to play my instrument. <laughs> um, and that was at Roosevelt University. We had a seminar where we had um, professionals from kind of different aspects of the industry come in. So we had a contractor come in. We had someone who ran their own studio um, come in, and they shared their materials. Um, you know, the contracts they used. We had an accountant come in that shared with us, you know, a budget sheet, what you'd have to keep track of um, for, you know, basically running your own business as a freelancer. Um, so that was helpful and that kind of gave me an idea. Um, but I didn't start creating things and, and working on projects until I got out of school. And I started that pretty immediately. I did it three degrees in a row. But when I got out of school, um, you know, I took a couple auditions, I was doing some teaching, I was playing with orchestras, but I felt like there was just a big gap in how much time and energy I had um, that, that wasn't used by, uh, you know, the time I spent working. So I started a concert series and an ensemble almost immediately out of school. But it took me a long time to figure out how to run those well. We did it really badly <laughs> for, for a number of years. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, hopefully our students are going to feel that <laughs> they're learning something in this class and in school and, and you know, 
I think you're right, schools are changing and they're starting to incorporate all of this more. Um, and having great guest speakers like you is, is a privilege and a unique opportunity, so thank you again for coming. Any other questions? Yeah, I was wondering if you applied for your life writing grants, whether with the Helix Collective or by yourself, and if you have, if, you, if so, any tips you have for writing grant, grant applications? Yeah, well this is one of the reasons why I think it's great to have you know, a variety of people coming in because we have not done a lot with grants. We've um, applied for a few, Chamber of Music America, New Music America, um, and we are currently bil building our board out from kind of our core group of musicians um, to have someone working on development. Um, but yeah, I, we, we have not had a lot of success with that. So our fundraising has been personal appeals and then like sponsorships with businesses uh, and ticket sales and, and then performance fees. So that's been mostly how we funded things. Can you tell us a little bit more about business sponsorships and your experience getting funds from sponsorships and corporations type of thing? Sure, yeah. Um, so uh, how we've done this primarily has been through the film festival. Um, and we were running that a couple years um, basically on ticket sales. Uh, and what we were hired as an ensemble, <coughs> excuse me, because <coughs> what we do with these, these concerts is we play live um, film scores to film, new independent films. And so we were hired to do that for a couple other festivals. <coughs> because we kind of figured out the process of creating that kind of show. And so I saw my friends that ran those festivals get sponsorships. And so I thought, huh, okay. <laughs> I, um, you know, so I could see, you know, the, the groups in town that were, were um, sponsoring. So like ASCAP and BMI are two big composer organizations that um, will sponsor events that feature composers. Um, and I just also brainstormed with our organization that was working with us and that was uh, the Academy of Scoring Arts about um, businesses that composers use. So um, recording studios that composers will hire out for things and also sample libraries and other um, you know things that composers buy because a lot of our um, we had a lot of applicants for composers and a lot of people in the film music industry that were coming. So that was kind of our audience. Um, and that's who we could sell to businesses. So we were trying to target businesses that wanted to reach composers. <clears throat> and that was our primary target. So another one was like UCLA um, Extension has a, a, com a composer um, program where you can go study um, film music, um, composing for film. Um, through their extension program. So, you know, they're li looking to reach composers and we had a lot of young composers that were working with our ensemble. So, um, so basically, um, I crafted an email which gave um, our sponsors different options. And um, so it's kind of like a Kickstarter campaign where there's, you know, different prizes for different levels. And so, uh, you know, for uh, $500, you could be included on our website, um, and I'm just, this is an example, these aren't actual numbers, I, <laughs> I would have to look them up, um, but, uh, uh, and, and you'd be included maybe in programs, so like a half page ad would cost this much, and a full page ad would cost this much, and being on the, the seven repeat behind the red carpet would cost, um, would cost that much, so for, for kind of increasing levels of sponsorship, um, then you could um, have advertising in, in different parts of the festival. Um, so, so essentially the email has to be just really clear and give them options, and generally they'd like to just choose. So, oh yeah, we want a half page ad that seems like a reasonable amount of money, and they'll, you know, and they'll just kind of go for that. So um, sometimes I'd just be emailing info at this sample library, you know, <laughs> and just kind of getting, getting a finding, targeting a business and just, you know, emailing kind of cold. Um, and sometimes I would know someone who had, you know, people are a little proprietary about, um, about if they've gotten a sponsorship, they're probably not going to give you any direct information about <laughs> who to email about that. 
but you know someone who has another connection with the organization may be able to connect you with someone uh, who can pass you on to the person who would would buy sponsorships because it's generally you know one or two people within an organization that you're trying to reach that actually do that so it may kind of it may kind of start with contacting one person in that organization and finding out, you know, who you need to contact about that. In that email that you send out, do you have an introduction sent, uh, section that explains who the audience will be for your festival? In other words, do you yeah. explain to them like a little pitch of this is why you want to sponsor us type of thing before you start showing the different packages that they can select? Right, yes. Sorry, I left that out and that's really important. And <laughs> so yeah, so it starts with an introduction of you know who who the festival is. Um, it's important that the festival is run by Helix Collective, that's a nonprofit. Um, so that's an advantage that we have um, and and saying kind of what our mission is about bringing together young composers. Um, and then you know, but that only takes a sentence or two, and then I talk about who our audience is, basically, who are you going to reach by um, by sponsoring through us? And so I say, you know, how many applicants, composer applicants we have, you know, who our audience is made up of, and um, you know, the fact that we've sold out for four years in a row. And um, so I can kind of guarantee them the number of people in a certain industry that they they be able to contact. So yeah, definitely, that's that's a paragraph, and then followed by the sponsorships, and um, and sometimes there's some negotiation there as well, um, you know, for the specific needs of an organization. Maybe they don't want a whole package, they just want to buy an ad and they don't, you know, if they don't want to call it a sponsorship, you know, we can kind of, if we leave things open to make it work for them, um, then that's been helpful. How has your re response rate been for cold emails versus prior connections or personal connections? In other words, do you think it works to just send out cold emails? Obviously, if you have a connection, it's the best, but have you had any success in just cold emailing those organizations that you didn't have someone? Yeah, for, spo for sponsorships? Yeah. We did, yeah. Our signature sponsor this year, actually Orange Tree Samples, um, I just emailed info at Orange Tree Samples, um, and they, they were actually our biggest sponsor last year. Um, and it's because it just really works for them, I think, you know, and it happens that that was a small company. That was one of the reasons that, uh, you know, I knew to go to that company because a friend of mine knew them. Not everybody would know that company. You know, I wasn't going to, you know, the biggest, uh, I was also trying, you know, the biggest organizations, but that was a small organization and that really worked for them. Um, so uh, the response rate, you know, I did just so much cold emailing actually that I didn't have uh, a lot of, um, of prior connections. So, so, so I had, a, you know, I had kind of more data on cold emailing, um, which worked out, you know, in this case. And, and um, when I had a connection, you know, that worked as well. So I, I can't really speak to that. I would assume, you know, connections, uh, you generally have a better response rate. But, but it's good to do both. You never know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we, you know, we got the most out of um, kind of cold emailing. And yeah, cool. it, it, it takes... It, yeah, if, if you're going cold, it takes, you just need to really contact a lot of people. Great, great. So I'll let other questions. Any other questions? Matt? Yes. Along those lines, who, did, who was it, uh, was there a common denominator of the person or the title of the person within an organization that ended up being the one to make the payment to you? Do you have like a general uh, idea of what title that person held? I don't. Um, <laughs> in some cases, it's it's owner of the business. Um, in in some cases, it's head of the head of the program. Um, that like uh, like at a school, it's it's the head of the program that went into advertise with us. Um, and in the case of an organization like ASCAP, they have people that are the ones that do the sponsorship, but that wasn't in their title. Um, so, so it was, yeah, I didn't, I didn't catch a title of the person that generally makes this decision. So it, it does take a little bit of just asking around in, in any given 
organization. And if you can, if you can access the person at the top, of course, that's helpful. Depending on the size of the organization, in a small organization, it's great to talk to the um, the, the director or the owner. But that's a really good tip about not necessarily limiting yourself to large companies, mm. but to look for perhaps small businesses that would be very strategic to your mm -hmm. mission to your vision that would really align. Um, that's very interesting uh, advice, because generally when we think of corporate sponsorship, we tend to associate with huge companies. And you can be a, a very small fish in a huge pond there, so it's good to be able to try to reach perhaps not necessarily only large corporations, but also small businesses that may be interested um, in supporting. <coughs> exactly, yeah. I think. We, we've always thought about kind of going to, to groups that are kind of in the same place where we are. So as a nonprofit and we're pairing with other nonprofits, it's also ones that are, you know, fairly new, have, have been nonprofits for a few years and, you know, they're a new film organization or they're a new film music uh, educational organization. And, and, and so, yeah, you don't want to limit yourself, but um, definitely, you know, your local piano shop. Um, they they are wanting to advertise and they don't want to throw their advertising money necessarily to the general public. They want to target it. So if you if you have people that they're trying to find, that's valuable. Yeah, that's exactly what you can provide as a benefit, the target audience. That's great. Exactly. That's great. Yeah. Other questions? Kyle. Yes. So you're involved with a lot of things during your week or during your month. Uh, what time management and uh, organizational strategies can you suggest for people who are doing those things? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think it's I think it's personal, and so probably experimenting with with things that work for you. You know, I think as you come up through school, you probably learn a lot of strategies and because, you know, you're in classes at different times and your schedule is to a large degree on your own. Um, but you do have, I think the thing that people lack when they get out on their own is those um, deadlines. And, and that, that's the thing that you get with classes in school. This paper is due then, this is the thing is done then. And so I try to work into my life accountability and deadlines. And, and so, you know, I have some kind of regularly scheduled things like, you know, I always, um, I always practice at this time. If I can, I usually, um, you know, have a, a chunk of two or three hours in the morning where I work on, um, you know, organizational tasks. So this is when I'm, you know, it changes over the year, but this is when I'm emailing for sponsorship. This is when I'm emailing for booking. So I kind of have those chunks set aside in the day. Um, and I have, you know, a to-do list that I open every morning with things that are prioritized. So these are the things I really want to get done today. These are things for this week. These are things I'm looking for over the month. And I'm kind of constantly moving that. Like, you know, I'll look at something and I'll think, okay, this is a lot bigger than what I can do today. And I just kind of, you know, move it down or I take it apart and say, okay, I can get this much done. Um, so I, I kind of always have a running list of tasks and it really makes me happy to be able to like remove something um, <laughs> from, from the list. So, so I try to uh, keep myself accountable and um, with um, our ensemble, uh, we're, we do um, regular meetings, and so we're kind of keeping each other accountable, and we can, you know, get updates um, on what everybody's doing, and we get together regularly to make sure that um, that we're moving forward on things, so that you can, um, to some degree, um, not outsource accountability, but you know, have have a group that's that's working together on that. So you set deadlines for yourself on the different tasks that you need to do. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I mean, I know there's things I dread. Like, I actually hate emailing people. I don't hate it as much as calling people. Um, <laughs> I like, I, I actually like, I don't even like calling for like getting a pizza, you know. I <laughs> I think I'm uncomfortable to call people I don't know. Um, so it really helps if, if I just have a, like a, like you must do this on Tuesday. You must do this by noon, not Tuesday. You know, this is like a morning task, and that really helps me with things I don't want to do. Um, to for me, that's because um, I'm I'm. 
I'm very time oriented, maybe because I'm an orchestral player, like I have to be somewhere 10 minutes early, we're out at 10 p.m. Um, so for me, that's what really motivates me. And um, so I can use that as a, a carrot and a stick for myself. Have any of you set deadlines for yourselves on things that are not school related, obviously, because the schools always have deadlines, but your own deadlines. How many of you have, have used this practice of setting yourself deadlines? Good for you. Look. Nice. <laughs> so you'll be fine when you graduate. You'll be fine. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And it and it helps if it if it's just things are just too big to get done quickly to kind of break things up into achievable tasks because there's a lot of things you do when you work for yourself that seem just unbelievably large. Yes. You said you spent a couple hours of your day booking like sponsorships and uh, gigs. How far in advance do you usually have to look to book a gig? Um, so if it's a concert series that's classical, then they're usually booking for next season. It depends on the size of it. So if you're looking, um, for like a college or a, a local concert series, they may be booking now for their entire 2018, 2019 season. Um, so, so that's a good time. If, if we're self-presenting, um, then we need probably a solid two months to, to um, gear up the marketing for it. And, you know, at least a month in advance, we want all, all the marketing out and the press releases out. Um, so, so that's just a matter of um, you know booking a space we really want. Um, I'm trying to think of some other examples. Um, yeah, so if you get into really big festivals, sometimes they're almost like a year and a half in advance, or even two years in advance. Um, so it, it kind of depends on on the size of it. But the thing that you can do is you can kind of reach out. And, um, you know, if they're already, say you want to do something this spring, maybe somebody needs something filled in um, that, you know, somebody got canceled, or you can, you can make that contact now for next year. Um, so so you, you, they may often tell you, like, because it varies, different concert series do book at different times. So they may tell you, oh, look, I'm just gonna sit down and look at this in January. So then you can make a note in your file to, to get back to this person at that time. Um, so that you kind of have a running calendar that you can get back to people um, you know, every few months or when they say they're gonna be booking for the next year um, and kind of stay on people's minds. Sarah, you uh, mentioned when you self-produce an event and you have to calculate the time for marketing, I think it would be very interesting if you can share with us um, how you, you know, figure out, I mean, at this point with so many events that you've produced, you mm -hmm. must have kind of like a template for the marketing strategies, right? Or, or pretty much like a plan, a, a, an overall plan of action. Could you walk us through the process of marketing a self-produced event? Sure, yeah. So if it's a, a concert in town, maybe 100 to 200 people, um, then we'll usually, if I'm, if our group is the only one playing or performing, then I have all the materials assembled maybe a month ahead of time. If we have another group that we're working with, um, maybe like two months out, six weeks ahead of time, I'm going to start collecting things from them so that I can make um, so I want pictures of all the groups, I want videos that I can share, so video links, um, and then um, uh, write-ups about the groups and the concerts that's going to happen, and then I have that written into a press release. Um, we usually do it a month ahead of time just because of how quickly life moves, but I think it doesn't hurt to do it two months ahead of time. Um, and I, I will send that out to my, um, to my press contacts. And a group of those contacts, I'll, I'll email directly and say, oh, we'd love to have coverage on this, or, you know, we'd love it if you could come to this, and, you know, we have a ticket in your name if you'd like to come. Um, and then going to every single calendar <laughs> and 
and putting, you know, just taking the information on the show and putting it in. So, um, you know, if Can I... Can you elaborate what type of calendars you're referring to? Are you referring to community yeah. calendars? What type of calendars? Community calendars, um, there's uh, newspaper calendars, and there's uh, like Yelp, you can put in events on Yelp, you can put in events on, this is a little bit going abroad from calendars, but also like uh, writing in meetups, um, doing your Facebook events. Um, so, so all of those, I basically need the information on the concert, the write-up, the picture, and uh, um, a link to a video about it. So once I have that assembled, then I can put that in, in all those places about a month out. Um, and then my email list, um, I generally email them. They're a little bit broken down into different lists. So um, for example, if we're doing something through Costco Revolution, um, the, those are usually Silver Lake based because we've been, which is a neighborhood in town. So um, you know, if something's going to be in that area, or um, Hewlett, we have lists for Hewlett's Collective that are like composers that have a different interest than maybe our general list. Um, but sending out those to email lists a month ahead of time, two weeks ahead of time, and then a reminder um, the week of the show. So I'll, I'll send out um, three for a general event. And how did you put together those email lists? Um, so we, one way which is, is a little bit random is we go to a lot of networking events and everybody gives us cards. Um, so our kind of industry list um, is, is, you know, I ask them if I can put them on the list and, and have them, uh, you know, connected with us. Um, but the, the email list for our general audience was developed by, um, by getting them mostly at the concerts. We have um, a sign up through Facebook and through our website as well, but mostly we've gotten them through the concerts. So we do raffles. We raffle something, we have like, we made CDs before, we have tons of those. <laughs> the extras of those that we can give away or um, the LA Phil um, was, uh, we had a trade with them where we would include something about their concert in our email and they'd give us tickets to raffle off. So we just gather emails in exchange for, um, for something that we could give away for essentially a raffle. Um, so that's, that's where we got most of our, um, you know, uh, concert attendee emails, um, you know, people who have applied to the festival. Um, and uh, then for the, for the press, I had a friend who um, had been putting on concerts for, I think, 30 years here in LA who shared some of his contacts with me. And then just um, finding, finding press contacts through looking who was writing about events in town, seeing, you know, the featured events that we wanted, you know, we wanted to be covered in. Looking at the byline, who that, who, who's writing that, and finding their email is how I kind of worked on the press um, list. Fantastic. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> <After> <laughs> emails, then what is the right. Okay. And then, um, so, and in, in the past, you know, year, year and a half, we've been doing um, Facebook ads, um, which are we. Not very expensive, but maybe about two weeks out, maybe a $20 Facebook ad that will target to different audiences depending on what we're doing. So maybe we can target the neighborhood. Maybe if we're featuring a cellist, we can target cello. If we're featuring film music, so we can target based on interests and geographical area. Um, and and then also, so most of what we do in the last couple of weeks is so social media posts. So Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and um, just kind of keeping people aware that um, that the concert is coming. Wonderful. Good. Any other questions? It takes a lot of time. <laughs> and you have to practice to perform. Right. Right. right, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. And that's one of the biggest challenges I find is that it's actually just on the day of the show if you're, if you're organizing people and you also have to, you know, there's kind of, you're troubleshooting and firefighting and then sit down and play. Um, and I, I could outsource playing for some things and organize others, but I really like doing both. So I just kind of take the fact that that's challenging because I would rather be playing and I'd rather be helping make it happen. So um, it says you, you have to switch parts of your brain from talking to people and fixing things to performing. Uh, you have to get used to doing that quick. Right. When they have a smoke machine, it makes it all better, right? You can be <laughs> <in the place. laughs> 
love that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, it's the cool, yeah, it really, that was really fun. And <laughs> but yeah. We've got a few minutes left, so we can have maybe a couple more questions from the students. Anyone? So we have students that are, you know, as I said, finishing their graduate level degrees and others that are in their, you know, senior or junior or sophomore year at the undergraduate level. What could you recommend for, for these different moments of their lives, right? I mean, many of our undergraduate students may continue on to graduate school, but may not. So, and then many of our graduate students are done with like a doctorate and there's nothing after that. They can't keep going to school. So what advice would you give to these two you know, types of students that are in different moments of their lives? Um, let's start maybe with undergraduate students. Do you have any like, piece of advice that you could recommend for undergraduate students, what they could consider? In addition to obviously graduate school, which is the first thing that comes to mind, right? But are there any recommendations or tips that you could give first to our undergraduate students, and then we can talk about our graduate students who are in their terminal degrees? Yeah. I mean, just looking and observing some of the people who have done the best, kind of um, working as uh, performers or starting ensembles or um, you know, kind of doing anything independent in the music industry, they've started really early. Um, so at least kind of gathering your your cohorts, maybe an ensemble, maybe an organization you have in mind, um, starting to develop connections. And um, I think there's earlier the better. And um, to just, and you may have some idea and try it out and it doesn't work, um, but starting to experiment with what what do I really want to be doing with my time? Why, you know, why why am I in music? And 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 what do I want to contribute with that? And what do I want my life to look like? And because it's not, I, I have found that that's it. Those answers don't get quite, don't get an, those questions don't get answered in you know kind of the normal course of getting degrees. Um, because even if your main source of income is teaching or your main source of income is freelancing, you know, you still have to kind of confront those questions about, um, you know, what, what do I really want to drive? What are my projects going to be? You know, what, what do I want to see done? So just thinking about that and, and starting to just experiment with, with the project. Like, for example, I have a little chamber group. We have to do... Uh, you know, an end of year recital. Can I figure out how to book another place that I can play that? Can I, you know, bring an audience in? Can I just experiment on a small level with, you know, making something, making something happen? Um, I think that's really great. And then I, I think we should really challenge the assumption that you should go straight on to more and more school. And um, because you have to think about what it what it really provides for you. If you're if you're in performance and you want to be a better player, how much money um, goes towards um, you know lessons like you know getting advice from someone in your instrument compared to what tuitions uh, you know and how much opportunity to play do you get in a performance program that you may be able to recreate in another way. Um, I know that you're competing in, in the kind of music world with people who own a lot of degrees, but I can tell you that I don't know which of my friends are doctor and which aren't, and it doesn't, unless they're you know going for tenure track college jobs, and there are very few of them, you know, it doesn't really seem to affect how much they get paid for things and what kind of opportunities come up, and that's really done through their networking and the work they do, you know, emailing people for jobs and, you know, saying, you know making things happen for themselves and, or just getting known in town or really known around the world as, oh, you know what, I'm the rock cellist or, you know, that, that kind of work. Um, so, so yeah. And, how, and about, then, how about for graduate students who are done with their doctorate and trying to figure out, you know, now what? Right. <laughs> 
I mean, it, it, it's, I will say it's kind of a relief to have a doctorate because you know you never have to do it again. Um, <laughs> so, so that it, it, is, it is there and you never have to go back and like, you know, it's paid for and, and you know, that you, you always have it. Um, so it's, it's nice to have that, even though when I got out of school, I didn't go straight into the applying for academic jobs thing um, because I really wanted um, to work in the industry and to have, if I went back to teaching at some point, to have you know a lot of experience to share. Um, and I think that's something to keep in mind to be competitive. Um, even for teaching, you need to have um, more to give than I've done degrees because every everybody has that. So having kind of a wider swath of experience, I think that's what you can start doing is making sure that you have, um, you know, other other skills that you can share um, as as a teacher. You know, if if you're entrusted with students that want to be musicians. Do you have the skills to help them succeed? Um, so, so building your own real world experience so that you you know how to do that. And, and yet, yeah, talking to people who have recently won jobs, um, in, in, in teaching jobs, if that's really what you're after, is seeing if you can get a hold of their resumes, if you can get a hold of their, um, you know, if you have friends that are pretty close that might share you this, and um, their cover letters and it, you know exactly what it what it looks like, what kind of materials they have on there. Um, so you can see and at just asking them about their interviews and the kind of things that got asked just on that direction, knowing what's appealing to schools, I think is talking to the people who have most recently been hired have the best um, kind of lead on that. That's a great advice. And uh, when you go perform in a place that you're not familiar with, that you don't necessarily have a network, how do you go about creating a marketing strategy? Do you just look things up online and just have the same tactics, only cold, cold emailing type of thing? I mean, do you pretty much repeat the strategy you just described to us, no matter where you go? Yeah, well, I will mention a pitfall which we have just like fallen straight into with Helix Collective several times, which I, I don't like, I don't know how we seem to like have fallen into it several times. When we're hosted by someone in another city, we often think like, oh, they have the contacts here, they're going to promote the concert, and that doesn't work very well. <laughs> so, so even if, even if you don't have contacts there, and um, it's it's more and more that the, the, the marketing and the PR is in your hands, um, you know, as as the players, and it's it's dangerous to assume that any presenting organization is going to handle that for you. Um, so yeah, it's basically what I did in LA just before I had the contacts, which was I just had to find them. You know, you're looking for groups that are interested in in what you're doing. There's Facebook groups, there's meetup groups, there's um, you, you know, emailing. A friend of a friend. I had, you know, I was emailing. My parents lived in DC like 30 years ago, but I still, like, when I was playing there three weeks ago, I was like, hey, do you guys know anyone in DC? Because I was literally going to try anything. Um, because, like I said, it's, it's just, it's, it, it's kind of in your hands. And then Facebook ads, you can target. Um, you know the people in that area, and and you know on Twitter and Instagram you can um, you can tag you know organizations that might be interested. So you can kind of basically you're looking for ways to to target target and contact people um, in as targeted way as you can that might be interested in what you're doing. That's fascinating. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for sharing all your experience. It's so inspiring to get to connect. You know, musicians who are so busy in the world making a difference, making the world a better place through their craft and their art, and getting our students to meet them and to get inspired, because I'm sure they're all going to go on and do great things as well. So thank you for, for you know, sharing your time with us, and it's been wonderful having you, and I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you.